What's going on, rock stars? Welcome back to the 1% Life Show. I couldn't be more thrilled for the guest that I am bringing you today. My guest today has helped CEOs, entrepreneurs, actors, and high performers from every industry gain clarity, focus, and confidence to grow their business faster while creating a better work-life balance. He's the author of a book that I just finished last night, super excited to, ta to talk about and to dive into, The Perfect Day Formula. He's also the author of this book, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is a Wall Street Journal bestseller, Unstoppable, and as well as uh, another book, The Perfect Week Formula. He's built f five seven-figure businesses, if I'm not mistaken, in five different industries has mentored thousands of entrepreneurs around the world, huge names that you would recognize. And I, I'm super excited to introduce you to the man they call the most disciplined, the world's most disciplined man. Craig Ballantyne, welcome to the 1% Life Show. Oh, this is gonna be so much fun, thank you. Super excited to have you here. Man, uh, I just got sucked into this book. I gotta tell you the, um, the perfect day formula. And I'm curious, what led you to writing such a book? I know this book was, it, it was written a couple years ago, but so timely for today, but what led you to actually write the perfect day formula? Can we start there? Yeah, absolutely. So it was really, it was really a manual of like my manual for what allowed me to become more productive. And so, you know, the whole little shtick about the world's most disciplined man really came from a bunch of my friends who were like, how do you get so much done? How do you, you know, I have like, a bunch of email newsletters and I was writing content for them and creating lots of programs and all this types of stuff. And they were like, I just don't understand. How do you get so much done? And it really is the formula for it, which anybody can customize for their own life. And it's really just a matter of principles. So I had, I had just started writing probably in about 2013, really, really had a hard time figuring out what to call it, what order to put the stuff in. And so I actually, I ended up writing about 300 pages and they only used about 125 or so. So it was a real, uh, real waste of some of my time that for all those pages that I wrote, but it was just over the years, all this stuff that I had built up and shared with so many people like yourself and my coaching clients and my friends, busy parents, entrepreneurs, you know, people who weren't entrepreneurs and was able to help them make more time for what matters. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And one of the things you really talk about in this perfect day formula, <clears throat> excuse me, is your morning, right? And setting your morning up to, to win. And, and I got to be honest, and I'm really curious about your psychology behind this. It's something that I personally have struggled with, the whole notion of circadian rhythm and, you know, when I do when I work best. So I'm curious to hear, first of all, your take on what is this morning? Like, should it start like, and should it be like, and I say should, you know, um, mm -hmm. because that's, you know, I think what you believe that your morning should look a certain way. And then how does one deal with that, um, their circadian rhythm and really integrating that into creating their perfect day? Right. So, so the fundamental principle is this, that no matter what time you get up, and I'm a big believer that it's not about the hour that you get up, but it's about what you do with the hours that you are up. So if I say that again, it's just simple. It's not about the hour you get up. So 5am club, I don't care for it. I don't care if you get up at 9am, 11am. I've had clients and friends of mine who have built nine figure businesses working between 10pm and 4am. Now they don't do it anymore because it's probably not the healthiest thing for you, but you can, you can use these principles at any time. So first of all, let me say, just relax if you think that I'm gonna be here and saying you gotta get up before the sun rises. You don't. Now, the world is set up in a way where even in this crazy world of you know, working at home and Zooms most of the time, it's still generally set up that you work during the day. And so you then have to think about well, what that means to most people, and uh, you know, my brother-in-law is typical of this, is that he's basically sitting in a chair on one Zoom call after another from eight until five every day. Now, if you actually want to get anything done, your best chance of doing that is in the morning before that, because uh, Daniel Pink has a book called When, the Scientifically Perfect Time to Do Anything. That's not the subtitle, but it's something like that. And he says, we have the greatest discipline, willpower, and intention in the morning. The greatest discipline, willpower, and intention in the morning. 
And I always actually, I say that this is kind of like God's, one of God's little tricks on us because he gave us the greatest discipline in the morning and he gave us chocolate cake and wine at night. So, you know, we're mismatched and that's why we always have a hard time saying no at night. And, and so if Makes we sense. know that, that's, uh, that just is unfortunate. <laughs> you know, I've had many uh, business dinners out where I'm like, no, I'm not having anything. And then sure enough, I'll have something um, back in the day when I was not the most, most disciplined man. Uh, now I've got the systems in place for it, but <clears throat> I built my day. It was kind of similar to that. I used something that I stole from stoicism. This little phrase, control what you can, cope with what you can't control and concentrate on what counts. And it's the anchor of that book and my formula because I realized, you know, we have the greatest control in the morning. There's fewer things begging for our time and attention at eight in the morning compared to three o'clock in the afternoon when everybody's got a deadline and they all want you to help or people want to have meetings. You know, people don't want to have meetings at seven o'clock in the morning. And this is a great opportunity for everyone to, as soon as they possibly can in the morning, use this little phrase, GSD on your MIT ASAP. GSD on your MIT ASAP, meaning get stuff done on your most important task as soon as possible. Because what happens if, you know, to my brother-in-law, for example, if he doesn't, if he knows that he has a huge meeting at three o'clock in the afternoon with uh, somebody who's going to buy, he sells credit cards or something. And it's like, uh, you know, so, so some company is going to switch from MasterCard over to Visa and, and you know, buy from him and he's got to have a great presentation done. Well, if he thinks he's going to get that presentation done at 1.30 p.m. when he has a 30-minute window, of course he's not. He's only going to get it done if he does it before the Zoom, Zoom calls start at 8 in the morning. And it's the same with all of us is that we have that greatest discipline, willpower, and attention, the greatest control, the greatest focus, and the fewest distractions in the morning. And so that's why we must take advantage of it, whether it's writing a book, creating a sales presentation, or, you know, if we have a lot of success financially and we've let ourselves go physically and we don't love exercise, well, when I was a personal trainer, and that's where I started out in this great long journey, <clears throat> I, I, I was always like, why do these CEOs want to come in and train at six o'clock? And one of them actually said to me, hey, can you come in at five? Like the gym only opened at six. I'm like, no, I'm not coming in at five. That's crazy. Why would anybody want to work at five? And I didn't understand that until later on when I realized if this guy doesn't work out at six o'clock or five o'clock in the morning, he's not doing it at four o'clock in the morning when he has three kids and, you know, 150 employees who want his time. There's no way he's doing it later in the day. And so whatever it is that's your MIT, you got a GSD on it ASAP. God, I love that. Okay. Let's say G, get, GSD, stuff, GSD, get, stuff, done. get stuff done on your most important task. So MIT. Yeah. And then what was the last part again? ASAP. ASAP. I love this it. Is, so, you know, so, so again, it doesn't matter what time you wake up. It's not about the hour that you get up. It's about as soon as you can GSD on your MIT ASAP. That's what it is. I love it. And it, and it feels like that um, for someone who's an entrepreneur, for example, what specific to their industry or their niche, what is that most important thing to them, right? To their business. And is it in that moment in time where they're at in their, in their business specifically, or what's the needle, what's the needle mover? What's it like, is it, is it, could what, it be what region? I, could it be, you know, like, we like to put it as RGA. So revenue generating activities Cool. Mm -hmm. or, and, and again, it could be different every day. It could be different during seasons of, uh, of the industry or whatever, right. but generally look at it as like, okay, what's like the most important thing for me to do in my business? If you're an entrepreneur, you have to generate revenue. You have mm -hmm. to generate leads. You have to uh, close the leads and the sales, however that may be. So my particular MIT right now is to write new Facebook ads every single morning. I live on the West coast in uh, Canada. My team is on the East coast. We have a meeting at 7 a.m. Pacific standard time. 10 a.m. their time because we have to get the Facebook ads up and running before noon in order to collect data on them so that we meet again the next day. And so I have to write a Facebook ad or two or an email or, you know, a new lander or whatever, a uh, new headline. I have to do that stuff. That's the most important thing that I have to do before that seven o'clock meeting because that's like our biggest revenue generating activity. So that's what I'm doing today. Now, in 2013, the most important thing that I did was I would wake up and I would write 
a thousand to fifteen hundred words for that book. Some days I only had fifteen minutes, and I would write five hundred words. Because if you're an expert in your subject matter and you can type at a decent pace, you can write about five hundred words in fifteen minutes. Now you're going to need editing on it later, but if you did that six days a week, in ten weeks you would have a thirty thousand word mini book. Maybe you know it takes another ten weeks to get you to forty five or fifty really quality words, but you can write that book in under half a year. And so if you think like, what can you possibly do in 15 minutes or how long is it going to take me to write this book in 15 minutes a day, six days a week, you can write a 45,000 word book in under half a year. That's how quickly you can do it. And I know this because when I was a broke struggling personal trainer back in the early 2000s, I didn't want to be a broke struggling personal trainer. And I wanted to have an online business. The thing is, I was training people at six o'clock in the morning till 11 and then from two until five or six. And for me to try and come home at night and work on that business, I would sit in front of the computer and it felt like someone was sticking glass shards in my eyeballs because I was so tired. And I realized the only way that I'm going to pull this off is that I, instead of me getting up at, at 10 to five in the morning in order to get showered, catch the bus downtown Toronto and train um, in the wealthy neighborhood that I had to actually get up at 4.30 in the morning and work for 15 to 20 minutes on my online business, writing emails, writing sales copy, maybe creating a new program. And it took me 12 to 18 months, but I was able to, in that 20 minute slot, six days a week, I was able to build a six figure business. And that was where I learned the power of the 15 to 20 minute improvement. And so whatever area you are a subject ex uh, matter expert in, you know that, yeah, in 15 to 20 minutes, you can drill on a sales objection thing and get better at sales, or you can go to the gym or you, you know, even to your home gym, or even just with your body weight, do a great workout in 10 to 20 minutes, or you can do this or that, or the other thing in just 10 to 20 minutes. You don't need, now it'd be great if you could get 90 minute blocks, but you don't need 90 minute blocks in order to make some progress. And so that's another lesson that I'm trying to encourage people here that, okay, great. GSD, MAT, ASAP. Well, you know, I got to get, you know, at the earliest I could get up at six o'clock, the kids get up at, you know, six 30. Um, and then I got to be out the door at seven 45 in order to go to the office. There's no way I can do anything. Yes, there is. You get 15 minutes from six to, you know, from six 15 to six or six 10 to six 25 before the kids get up. You can yeah, do impressive achievable. things. Like, yeah. If you can't say yes to 15 minutes and for yourself, right? For well, the then you're always, you're always going to be saying no, no to those things that you want. And, I love and, that. It's such, it, that was the thing I was trying to really grasp my head around. It's like 15 minutes. What can it, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And, and the way you just broke this down makes it, look, you're a subject matter, matter expert in one thing. What is that thing? Or what's that thing you're working towards in mastering, right? Is it your sales presentation? Is it, you know, like, you're right, ad copy. I love that you just made that clear. It may be something different from day to day, whatever it is that you're working on as an entrepreneur, or if you're in, you know, that, that most important thing that's going to, what I say is going to move the needle forward, right? It's going to really make the biggest impact on your business, which for entrepreneurs is revenue generating activity. Generally, yeah, most, most Generally. of the time. Now, now for a while there, for me, it wasn't okay. writing Facebook ads. It was writing the book because uh, it was when I was writing that book, we had a very strong fitness business, but I didn't want to be in the fitness business anymore, you know, selling the online programs. I wanted to switch to over. Um, we were on, I was doing part-time the business coaching of entrepreneurs and I want to do a full-time. So the thing is like, I got to make the transition. What's going to help me make the transition writing the book. Okay. So I stopped doing the ads and I went to a, it was a non-revenue generating activity. Now it was, um, as Stephen Covey would call it, it was a non-urgent, but important activity. And so oftentimes I tell people that in that morning time, you might choose a non-urgent but important activity. And so let's break down the differences between urgent and important and non-urgent important. So yeah. I'm a gym owner as well. I own three gyms. Two of them are in South Carolina. And every summer, without a doubt, the air conditioning goes out at one of those locations in South Carolina. Now, if you've ever been in South Carolina, even in April, let alone August, you know that you need air conditioning. So that's urgent and important for us to deal with that matter. Great. But I also want to write my book, which is important, 
Because if I want to transition from the fitness industry to business coaching industry, it helps to have a book and I need to write this book. I love books. I want to get this book out of my head and onto paper. Okay. Well, yeah, you got to deal with the urgent and important, but you can't only deal with those. You've got to put time into the non-urgent and important because if you don't write the book in the, in the morning, it's unlikely that you're going to find time to do it later on. I, I like to say that nobody finds time for anything. So everybody's sitting there going, I'm trying to find time to exercise. I'm trying to find time to read this book. I'm trying to find time for this new show on Netflix. I'm trying to find time to spend, you know, you know, to go see my, my brother and my sister, my mom more often. You're never going to find time. It is not under the bed with the ab rocker that you bought on an infomercial 15 years ago, collecting dust. Right. You don't find time. You only make time. So if you switch your head from, I'm trying to find time for something to, I'm going to make time for something, it's a totally different approach to planning your schedule. So I said, I'm going to make time in the morning to write my book. And if that means me getting up 15 minutes earlier than everybody else in the house, I'm going to do it. I'm going to spend 15 minutes on it and I'm going to chip away at it and I'm going to get to where I want to be by doing it this way. And then, yeah, I'm going to deal with the air conditioning, but the air conditioning has been sitting there broken for seven hours and 45 minutes. It can wait until eight hours. You know, it can wait another 15 oh. minutes. Those urgent, important emails that are sitting in your inbox that you know are there, they, they've been sitting there for 10 hours. So they can wait another 15, 30, 45 minutes. They can wait unless you actually run a critical care center, you don't actually have emergencies in your business. Emergencies involve 911 and blood, and you probably don't have any of those in your business. So just understand that what you think are emergencies are not in fact emergencies, and they can wait a little longer. Yeah, I love that. I love that. One, one question for you. Is the intent of the 15 minutes to literally give it 15 minutes, or is it to begin it with less resistance and then with the intention of potentially going longer? A bit of both. Um, now to somebody whose entire concept of, I don't start work until nine or 10 in the morning, then 15 minutes is literally 15 minutes because it's a new concept, right? It's like, you know, everybody's either started at, you know, everybody's, you know, just been a gym newbie at one point in their life. And now you don't go into the gym, whether you're running, whether, you know, eventually you want to run a marathon or bench 315 pounds, you don't go in and do the same workout that somebody who's been doing this for two to three years as, is doing. You go in there and if you're smart, you do a beginner approach to it. Just like when you change a diet, if somebody has been eating pizza and soda for dinner for the last three years, every single night, you don't put them on chicken and broccoli and expect them to stick with it. You know, you, you gotta be realistic. So I want somebody to give me 15 minutes because <clears throat> in some cases they only have 15 minutes and then the kids are up and it's a zoo, right? You know, and there's lots of people in that phase of life. Then there's other people who, you know, very much like when they don't feel like going to the gym, the trainer says, just go in and do five or 10 minutes, do the warm up, And the next thing you know, it, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. And maybe they do 30 minutes, maybe they do 45 Maybe they do the full 90 minute block. So in some cases it's like that, but at the very least it is 15 minutes and you've made some progress and it doesn't matter if the rest of the day is literally putting out fires or figuratively putting out fires, or you never get a moment for yourself and you blink and it's five o'clock. Nobody can take away that 15 minutes in the morning where you actually made progress and you have that victory. So even at the rest of the day, you get kicked around. You're like, okay, well, I still got 15 minutes. I still wrote 300 or 500 words on the book. And if I can just do that again tomorrow, step by step, I'm going to get there. That's what it is. So good. I love it. It just removes all excuses in my mind, right? Removes well, all excuses. That's, that's been in my entire career of everything that I've done has been about removing excuses. So when I started in the fitness industry, it's like, oh, you know, I don't have time to come in for an hour. Great. We'll do 30, 30 minutes. I don't even have time to come in for 30 minutes. Great. You're going to do these exercises at home in 10 minutes. I can, I can crush people in four <laughs> minutes. I have a, I have a workout video on YouTube that's been watched 7 million times, 5 million times since COVID hit. Um, it makes me like a wow. thousand, wow. thousand bucks a week in ad roll. Wow. And, uh, and it's, you do that four minute workout, you'll be, you will be crushed. And so I, you know, and then it was like, well, I don't have any equipment. 
no problem. I'll crush you in with body weight only. Oh, okay. So now you're down like four minutes and no equipment, like you're running out of excuses. And so my entire, what's left, <laughs> right. Yeah, my entire life, um, whether it's about productivity or starting a business from scratch, it's always been, okay, give me an excuse. I will, I will crush your excuse yeah. and show you how to do it because I'm just driven by eliminating excuses in people's lives so that I, I think oh, I just, I, I think I just actually became a coach so that I could get people to stop complaining. That's powerful. Uh, well, yeah. good luck. I, I just don't want, I just don't want you to complain anymore. So, so I'm just going to get rid of all your excuses. Yeah, and then exactly. they still complain and you're like, oh, I just can't. Yeah, dang it. I love that. So you talk about this, this concept that I was first introduced to in when I began my entrepreneurial journey back in 2015, which is structure equals freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've really held on to in the back of my mind, yet resisted on many different levels. Freedom number was my number one core value, always has been, left a multiple six-figure year job for it in sales. And, and it, it still maintains that, you know, freedom's my number one core value. Why, the resistance to putting in structure over the years of my business were real. And I really, it, it's really not up until the last couple of years that I'm really embracing it and realizing that Oh, no, no. You want to up-level your game? You have got to live by what you call rules for life, right? Yeah. And, and I love that. And when I read this, because a person, I reject rules in many ways, right? And, and, and based on why, you know, whatever, my freedom thing. S knowing that that's the thing that's going to get us there. So can you talk about these rules for life and, and where these came from and how someone can begin to implement their own rules for life that will... Mm -hmm. Really yeah, so, so I would say that the analogy, because again, when you hear that, you want to resist it. And the reason why you want to resist it is because most people think of rules as being externally forced upon them, right? Exactly. What, you know, I don't care where you stand on the mask thing. Like, you know, someone might say, well, I don't want to be forced to wear a mask. And, you know, that's why a lot of people resist it, you know? So it's like, if you tell me what to do, I will not do it. But if I decide for myself that it's a good idea, then I'll probably do it, which is a great lesson for whenever you're trying to persuade people to do things. So with the rules, a better analogy for it that helps people really get it is when I say, okay, think of your iPhone, right? Or your whatever phone you got. This phone, what does it have that allows it to do all this stuff? It has a powerful operating system, an operating system based on rules if x do y now imagine you had a powerful operating system for yourself that allowed you to make decisions easier with less stress um, with less willpower because if people are not familiar willpower is known through research as like a depletable resource so just like when somebody runs a marathon they only have a certain amount of stored energy in their muscles and they end up hitting a wall well it's the same with us in a course of a day. If we're you know, using our willpower to not snap in a traffic jam, using willpower in the office to not you know, argue with somebody, using willpower at lunchtime when people are you know, order in and they have junk, using willpower in the afternoon when it's somebody's birthday and there's cake and cookies, and then you get home and you've depleted all your willpower and discipline. Well, you know, because of all those decisions, you have decision fatigue mm -hmm. and you end up making bad decisions at home. So you're good all day and you blew it at night because you had no willpower. And uh, just a little side note, that's one of the reasons, according, you know, according to these guys, why Steve Jobs wore the black turtleneck all the time. I don't right. want to think about what I'm wearing. Exactly. Mark Zuckerberg, great t-shirt. Even Barack Obama apparently had a, a regular seal. Like I, he, he just didn't want the decision fatigue. And so if you have built rules for your life, then you have essentially pre-made decisions that can keep you out of trouble and that allow you to like, well, I don't have to think about, uh, you know, like you go out for a work lunch with people, <clears throat> you don't have to sit there and look at the menu and go, oh my gosh, I, I want to have that, but you know, I'm going to feel tired after, or, you know, people are going to say like, I can't believe you ordered that for lunch. If you just like every day when I go out to lunch, I order salmon and spinach and this and when I only have my business meetings at this restaurant during the week, because I know they have this and I go in, I don't even look at the menu. They know what to bring me. That's it. I don't even have to think about it. Well, now you can focus on the business lunch. You can keep your willpower and discipline. You can, you, you don't have decision fatigue when you go back to the office in the afternoon. 
And so it's, it's things like that. And the, and the way that I came up with it, I was sitting at, um, I was visiting my, my, uh, my mother at, um, uh, I grew up on this farm up in Canada. And so I was visiting her on the farm on a Sunday and, uh, it was around Easter Sunday of 2011. And I remember sitting there and I don't know why I started writing the article, but I, I thought, you know what, everybody has rules that they operate by. You know, like my mother, for example, she goes to church every Sunday. That's like, it's just a rule that she operates by. She plans her week around it, her Sunday around it, that, you know, at this time of day, she starts getting ready for church. And then, you know, she's home by this time. And it's like, it's a non-negotiable. And we, we have those things, you know, maybe you, maybe you're a triathlete. And so you do a, a minimum of an hour training session every single day. Maybe like that's non-negotiable. You're, you're in you know, Alaska for holidays in the summer, you're still training, you know, something like that. You're running, you're running on a, a trail where there might be bears, but that doesn't matter because you've got a rule that you always do an hour of training. You know, like people do things irrationally when they have rules around certain things. So you might have that, or you might be a vegan, right? If you're a vegan, you operate on a rule-based nutritional system. You no do not eat. No cheeseburger in your face is going to Right, yeah. As, as I use, you know, I use in the, in the book, Right. I say if two people are going to a party and, you know, one of them's a vegan, you know, like a birthday party or something, one of them's a vegan and the other one is not, and they're both trying to lose weight and the host brings around a plate of cheeseburgers, the vegan uses no willpower to say no. They just go, no, I just don't eat that stuff. I'm a vegan. I don't eat meat. The other person has to go, oh man, I really want that. Uh, no, not right now. I'm trying to lose weight. Perfect. First time they might succeed. The second time they're ready to break down. And the third time someone shoves it in their face and gives them pure pressure, you know, they're eating a cheeseburger and yeah. they're not just stopping at one. So if you have a rule, you you win. If you don't have rules, you're going to lose most of the time because your willpower is not going to be there. So now I'm not saying you need to have 9,000 rules. Like when I go to a birthday party on a Saturday, I only do this. Mm -hmm. you, you, you need to only have about five or six of them and they will make your life a whole lot easier. And are they, they're not meant to be broken, right? Like they're, they're, yeah, I mean, life. they're not laws. So they, okay. you know, rules uh, can bend a little bit, but in most cases, what you want to do is you want to stick, you want to create these rules and they might be, you know, a health rule, a wealth building rule, a personal development rule, you know, something around habits for sleep, you know, just some basics like that. They kind of build these that. boundaries for you. Yeah, you and talk about, do you still do the 8 p.m. and get up at 4 a.m.? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and, and there's thinking, what time does his wife or girlfriend go to bed? She goes to bed at the same time. She just sleeps longer. That's all. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's brilliant. And that's a rule that you created for yourself, right? Yeah. And, and it was built around um, me looking at my best schedule, mm -hmm. you know, my best schedule for getting stuff done for, you know, I'm, I don't like staying up late. I, I don't, I'm totally fine being up alone in you know, semi darkness writing. Cause that's just, that's just how I am. Now my way of living is not anybody else's way of living. So, you know, you could be like my friend, Joel, who built that supplement company from 10 PM till 4 AM. And I used to stay at his, uh, his family home in Florida. And when I got up, it was his signal to go to bed. I mean, it, it's neither necessary nor sufficient to get up really, really early to be successful. It doesn't guarantee success. And if you get up later, you can still be successful. But when you do self-reflection and introspection and you take a look at some biological rhythms, you can figure out what's the right 24-hour clock for you. And then you can stick to it as much as you possibly can. I love it. Can you share, would you be willing to share a couple other rules for life that you have? One of them is I don't curse or swear. So uh, I, I, read I tried that. I, I was yeah. impressed. I was definitely impressed. That one stumped me. <laughs> I yeah. loved it. I mean, and I was able to quit swearing in four days when I decided to do it. And oh, I don't have anything against it. I mean, I'm swearing in my head right now. But, um, you know, it's not like for any moral or ethical reasons. It's simply just I thought, okay, every single day in my newsletters, I tell people to do something that's difficult. Um, I tell them to improve themselves. And yet, you know, when I go out with my friends, I really swear a lot and I don't need to. So what if I just stopped? And so I decided uh, I get public accountability. I told my email list of 150,000 people, I'm not swearing anymore. And in four days I stopped 
And I just don't curse or swear anymore in public or in private conversations. I might swear if I see a bug at the house, but in general, I just don't curse or swear. And it's actually not that hard. Um, I, I made up some swear words that like I used the word sugar shack a lot for a long time, like oh, sugar yeah. shack and, and, but you can get over it. And, and here's the thing is that everybody's been in a situation where they didn't swear. So maybe it's anytime around, like maybe you don't swear in front of your grandma. Never in you know? front of my, my parents, never, like right. never. And, and that was one of the things that went through my head. Is Still like, to this day, 41. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had never sworn in front of my mother. I still never have. And I was like, and then I also, back then, I didn't swear on stage. I just didn't feel comfortable doing it when I was, you know, speaking at seminars. And I thought, okay, if I can do that, right. why can't I do it all the time? Completely. And and if I didn't tell somebody that, it's not like you'd be sitting around and, and somebody ever goes to you, wow, you don't swear. Like nobody ever notices it. And, and now I will admit that a well-placed F-bomb, you know, maybe, maybe if you use it like twice or once or three times at the most in an hour long presentation at an event, you know, these days you'll get some extra laughs. Massive but, pattern interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But if you use it every sentence, right. I mean, at, not only does it lose its effectiveness, but it actually becomes a, a turnoff in most cases. Sure. So use it wisely, but it's not, it's not the specific thing that I do. It's the fact that I conquered a thing. I love that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, again, every, anybody can use anything that they want to improve on. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you might, again, be operating on these certain things already. And in most cases, it's not too hard for people to put these down to go, oh, yeah, I always, um, you know, I always pray or meditate at, at 12 o'clock every single day. I've always been doing that. That really is a rule in which I live my life by. Okay, great. That one goes down. It's an anchor point in your life. And so you know that if, um, well, here's, here's a, maybe a better example. Like maybe you always spend Saturday afternoon with your family and your kids. Okay, great. So if that's the situation and somebody says, Hey, you know, we'd love to have you come speak at our event. You know, we'll pay you, uh, you know, travel and airfare and all that stuff. And, you know, we'll pay you 2,500 bucks but presentations at, uh, you know, on Saturday morning at night, or maybe it's Friday at four o'clock and you wouldn't be able to get home until four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. You would then say, no, I can't do it. Uh, I have a rule that I, you know, it's non-negotiable that at noon on Saturday, family does this, that, or the other thing. My kids are 10 and 11. I've probably got three years left before they want nothing to do with me on a weekend. So no, I can't, I can't do it. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to turn down the money. I, I could use the money, but I'm not going to do it because this is a rule. And then it's, then when people see, oh, that's how you use it. That's how you use it to keep yourself out of trouble, to make decisions easier. And then it's just, you've just got this, here are the parameters. And if it doesn't fit these parameters and it's a no go and it's yeah, easy it makes, that way. Makes total sense. My question is, so, so someone creates a set of rules, right? Rules for life. Mm -hmm. Now, do you just start them all right away? Like some of them are, I'm assuming new rules for life, right? Yeah. So what's your strategy around that? Well, you know, if we stick to just five or six, okay. you know, most of them will probably be pre-existing. And, you know, maybe one of them you're halfway decent at, but you need some more consistency. And then maybe one's brand new. Well, you know, oh. could I start the not swearing thing and going to bed at eight o'clock, could I try and start both of those habits? Sure. And if I find that I'm really struggling to get both of them, then maybe I'll just say, okay, you know what? I'll hold off on the swearing thing for a while and I'll just focus on this new one. So don't overload yourself. You know, when people try and make, you know, go cold turkey on 19 different things, it's obviously very difficult. So figure out what's the most important change for you to make and commit your resources to that. That's, that's fantastic. I love that. And I'm actually going to be writing my rules for life today and embracing oh, cool. them because they're my freaking rules for life. Not anybody nice. else has imposed upon me rules. That's, that's exactly cool. it, man. And we just, yeah, that's like, it. oh, do not tell me what to do. Exactly. But Ask if I think it's a good decision, then I'll right. do it. Exactly. I, I really do admire 
the rules for life now. And from that perspective, it's self-constructed so I can change them, but I certainly am going to hold myself up to that level of accountability. Um, really cool. What, so what I'm curious, what has changed or evolved or maybe even forgotten since you wrote the perfect day formula? I know I still, I'm excited to dive into the perfect week formula, which I started there and I was like, oh God, this is so good. And then I said, maybe I should start with the perfect day first. So I ended up going back to that one, but was there something that shifted since you wrote the perfect day that really has evolved since in terms of um, maybe a form like what you use now with your own in your own practice or with your own clients. Um, I'm leaving that a little bit ambiguous for you. No, no. I mean, it's here. Here's the good news and the bad news is that generally no. Cool. And and which is which I'm proud to say, because that means that, you know, it stood the test of time because, you know, a lot of people and there's nothing wrong with this. A lot of people change as they they go along. If, if you wrote a book at 25 about how to live life versus, you know, a book at 45 when you have three kids and, and so on and so forth, you'd obviously have a different perspective on how to live life. Now, you might still have the same, you know, I'm a free spirit type of thing and approach, but, you know, you'd have a different look at certain things. But I'm pretty, pretty sure that there are very, there's absolutely no major differences. And there's very few minor differences and that generally I live uh, my life the same way. The only thing that I'm actually trying to do different is I'm trying now to wake up at 4.30 in the morning. So mo most people have a hard time waking up earlier. I'm having a hard, right. hard time sleeping till 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> and, awesome. and, you know, so it's, it's probably a matter of, you know, years of conditioning. My brain gets up at that exactly. time. But, but I am trying to sleep a little bit later um, just to see if I can, you know, it's almost like a test of the system. Can I sleep a little bit later, but still um, in the perfect week formula, we kind of talk about putting, well, we really expand on the conversation, putting boundaries in your life. And if you put in the perfect week, most people, uh, you know, we challenge people and say most, what most entrepreneurs do is they say, well, I'm going to work as many hours as it takes to do this thing. We make people put their personal lives on the calendar first, and then we've shrunk the box. And now we say, okay, so you wanted to build, originally you wanted to build a $10 million a year business and you were willing to work 60 hours a week. Now we've shrunk the box. We've put the family stuff on and your personal recovery and all that stuff. So we don't want you to change your goal. But now you only have 35 hours a week to do it. And we still believe you can do it. Now you have to make better decisions with what you do with your time. And so I guess I'm pushing myself, okay, well, if I stay in bed longer, sleep a little bit more, um, you know, cut another half an hour from my workday. So I'm working seven and a half hours instead of eight hours. Can I still achieve the goals that I want to achieve? And so that's, that's the only thing I'm playing around with right and now. And what have but, you found? What have you, what are you finding rather? Is it, is it a behavioral change? Is it a decision change? Is it hiring more who's, you know? Well, I, right now I just can't sleep that long. <laughs> so, so it hasn't actually required me to do anything different. Okay. Um, okay. I think I got up at three 30 today for like, I just couldn't sleep anymore. So I got up anyways. And, but, but everything else, like it's still the no swearing and it's still, I, th I guess one thing that has changed is I, I, when I wrote the book, I was in more of what I call a maker's schedule. So a maker is somebody who doesn't really have a lot of responsibilities to other people. Um, you know, you like, let's say you're a book author. Well, if you're a book author, your primary, primary um, role is to get up and write. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You got to deal with agents and interviews and stuff, but, but now I'm less of the doer in the business and more of the manager of people in my business. And so now I need to be more responsive to them than ever. So I do, you know, I, you know, there was a point where I was not only not checking email until well after nine o'clock, I would actually go Tuesday and Thursday without even checking my email at all for like, it was a year long that I did that when I was in the maker schedule. Now that's not possible when there's like 20 people that I either have meetings with or whatever in a regular week. So I'm more of that uh, responsive. Now it's still, it's still not responsive until quite later in the day compared to, you know, I'm not getting up and looking at my email that is to say, but you know, it's only about an hour and a half later than I am. 
compared to five or six hours five years ago. Cool. I love, I love that. That's, and that's actually good feedback where you're at in your business that mm -hmm. you're not going, you know, there's a little bit of a change. Um, mm -hmm. Not going three days probably anymore doesn't serve the business needs. Right. Right. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So we just got a couple minutes. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, you got somewhere to be. And my question is what projects are you working on right now that are really inspiring you? Right now, um, it's, it's interesting how business works out. So we created this morning routine program in 2018. Mm -hmm. We couldn't figure out how to sell it on Facebook through advertisements. So we kind of put it off to the side. And then in early uh, this year, when COVID hit, <clears throat> we started selling a different program, uh, an Instagram marketing program on Facebook. Thing is, we couldn't make it work. And we were driving us nuts, but we were learning a lot, but we still couldn't make numbers work. And then one day, one of the guys on the team said, uh, this young man named Austin, who's really, really incredible marketer, he said, well, what if we try selling the morning routine? I'm like, okay, sure. <clears throat> you know, again, fortunately, nothing has changed about my ideas of the morning routine because I forgot what was in the program. And, you know, people were, we, we, so we started having success with it and now we're selling a lot of them and I'm really super excited to see people go from I bought doing, it. Yeah, I bought it. I thought you had an incredible funnel. I was like, look, showing my team, look at this funnel. This is amazing. I love how we did this, that, and the other. It was so, it was great. And, and, and it's work, and it's working great. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we were able to put that out there and I'm so excited about now, but we wouldn't have sold it if the other thing had worked. And so now, you know, we're getting all these people buying and they're saying, oh, I love day three, you know, day one or day two, where you say, go and get the eye mask and earplugs. And I'm like, I said that? I didn't even know that. I mean, I believe in it because I use them every night. So it's not like it's something I don't agree with anymore. It's just that I have no idea or had no idea what was, what was in the program. I just knew I still believed in it. So um, we're really excited about that. We're getting in the hands of, uh, you know, we've had people who are U.S. state senators. We've had actors by it. We've had, uh, you know, somebody who was the head coach of the West Point men's basketball team bought it the other day. And it's just really, really fascinating to see who's buying it. And then, you know, we have our perfect day kits that we sell on top of that. That was, a, that was something we, <laughs> right we put, yeah. <laughs> We put that thing together in 2015 and we've sold more this year than we did in the five. Well, maybe not this year yet, but we, we soon will have sold more in a 12 month period than we did in the entire five or six months prior to that. Because once you get an offer to start scaling up, um, you can really get a lot of numbers in. So that's what I'm super excited about because our whole, our whole thing is just get up and go to work. Whereas almost every other morning guru out there gives you this, you know, laundry list of stuff to do, which is actually, I call it a perverse form of procrastination. If you're getting up and doing an hour and a half before you even start thinking about work, you're giving away the best time of the day. So again, even if you got, even if you got up, did 15 minutes of work and then went and did your meditation and your yoga right. and your workouts and all that stuff, great. Because you at least got the 15 minutes done. And that's how important it is. And we're just, the feedback we're getting from moms and dads and authors and entrepreneurs and people starting a side hustle because they have to these days, it's really rewarding. Yeah, I'm excited about that 15 minutes and really mm -hmm. putting it into practice before I do my personal power rituals. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pumped about it. And actually, I feel like that's part, one of them now. So super pumped. Good. So Craig, I know you, you got a jet. How can people get in touch with you? How can they connect with you to find out more about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So if, um, if somebody wants to get one of the books, I do actually recommend starting with perfectweekformula.com. Oh man, <laughs> should yeah. listen to my intuition. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I, and here's the thing. I didn't write the book. I got Austin to write the book. I just told him some stories and, you know, he had, he watched all these presentations and I outsourced the book and it's actually my best book. Everyone likes it. They think it's the best written book. And it's actually the most helpful because I understand how to write a book better uh, with more stories. And, but it really, because obviously a perfect day formula, we got, you know, hundreds of reviews on Amazon and a lot of questions. Like, here's what you did wrong with the book. You forgot this. And I'm like, oh man, oh man, oh man. Um, so what we did is we then took everything we didn't cover and I did a perfect week formula, uh, hour long presentation at 75 events to refine it. And, 
And so I got through and made sure that we covered everybody's objections as to why this couldn't work. And then we wrote the book as opposed to writing the book and then hearing everybody's objections. And, and the other thing that we did, which was really neat, at least I think so, is that when we were ready for an editor, we just asked my coaching clients, we have like 300 coaching clients who said, hey, who wants to read the book this weekend and tell us you know, what spelling mistakes we made and what doesn't make sense. And so we had 25 people read it over the weekend and you know, we got rid of, well, there's still one spelling mistake that I found in the book, but almost every spelling mistake we got, again, we overcame every objection because we had people who volunteered to edit it who were our ideal customer list instead of somebody who's a book editor who really wouldn't have got it. It's incredible. I love it. So how can I connect with you specifically? Oh, right. So Instagram, real Craig Valentine, or email me at craig at godfather.com. Cool. I love it. And check the show notes, guys, for how, the spelling of Craig's last name. Um, there's a Y in it. So you want to <laughs> make sure that you get that. We'll have all of that for you. Craig, really, really, really enjoyed this session today. Super, um, just it feels felt so good coming into this. And I was really excited to just pick your brain a little bit deeper. And now I'm going to go read the perfect week formula. So you guys go, go cop the book, perfect day formula, unstoppable. And I'm excited about that one too. I'm kind of on a Craig Valentine tip right now. There you go. You can't tell. I love it. So thank you so much. Cheers to you and um, for all that you are and all that you do for the world. Thank you so much. Absolutely.